In some corners of the world where resources are scarce and innovation is a way of life, people have crafted extraordinary solutions to meet their transportation needs. From repurposed vehicles to makeshift contraptions, these methods reflect the resilience and resourcefulness of communities facing unique challenges. Join me on a journey around the globe. We're going to count down the top 15 most incredible makeshift transportation methods. Starting with number 15, bamboo trains. By October 2017, Cambodia's bamboo train, otherwise known as a nori, was no longer available in its original form due to the resumption of rail service between Popiet and Phnom Penh. However, the bamboo train was rebuilt near Wat Banan in order to cater to the local tourism industry. It opened in the middle of January 2018 and has been there ever since. The original trains ran at speeds of up to 50 kilometers an hour on the tracks around Batambang and Poi Pet. But apart from this new tourist-based track, the rest of the network originally built by the French colonial government is largely abandoned after the Khmer Rouge regime effectively shut it down. In fact, in 2006, the BBC reported that there was only one scheduled service a week and it ran at not much more than a walking pace, but they were certainly popular when they were operating at their peak. Noris had low fares and they were frequent and relatively fast, so it were popular even despite their rudimentary design, lack of brakes, the state of the rails, which were often broken or warped, and the lack of any formal operating system. Its simple construction and lightweight meant that a nori could easily be removed from the track, and if two met on the line, then one with the lighter load could be removed from the rails and carried around the other. At the end of the line, the vehicle would be lifted and turned. So in August in 2016, a nori was finally developed with a braking system. But sadly, it would be around in its original form for much longer. It took around four days to construct one of the vehicles, which had a steel frame overlaid with bamboo slats resting on the wheels from the abandoned tanks. Originally, it was propelled by hand using punt poles. Power was later provided by a small motorcycle or tractor engine, and fuel was bought from villages along the route and supplied in glass jars. There was precedent for the Nori's popularity, though. In the 1980s and 90s, due to the civil war in Cambodia, trains were led by an armed and armored carriage. The first carriages of the train were flatbeds used as minesweepers, and travel on these was free for the first carriage and half price for the second. These options were popular despite the obvious risks, and so next to this slightly scary option, the Nori must have seemed like a luxury. Number 14, Underground Funicular. The Underground Funicular is the second oldest fully underground urban railway in the world, after the London Underground, and the oldest in continental Europe, predating the Budapest Metro by 21 years. It consists of a single brick-lined tunnel measuring 540 meters long, 6.7 meters wide and 4.9 meters high, with only two stations, one at either end. The gradient of the tunnel varies along its length from 2% to 15. It was originally built with two parallel tracks. The modern line is a single track with a passing loop in the middle, a short duplex section where two trains pass side by sides, and the original rolling stock consisted of two wooden two-car trains. One car was reserved for passengers with its two classes provided, divided into separate sections for men and women. The other car was used to transport goods, animals, and carts. Power was provided by steam engines. The wooden carriages were replaced in 1971 with two electrified steel cars running on pneumatic tires over concrete tracks. But in 2007, a new generation of rolling stock was brought into operation. Today, each car can carry 170 passengers and travels at a maximum speed of 22 kilometers an hour. A trip from top to bottom takes about one and a half minutes, with a normal waiting time of about three and a half minutes. And a notable aside, in 2021, the first female driver joined the staff, which, given it's been around for so long, it was more than a little behind schedule. Number 13, Felucha Boats. A felucha, a traditional wooden sailing boat used in the Mediterranean, in Egypt and Sudan, particularly along the Nile and in protected waters of the Red Sea, and also Iraq. Its rig consists of one or two lateen sails and are usually able to board 10 passengers, along with a crew of around two or three people. Now, despite the availability of motorboats and ferries, felucas are still in active use as means of a transport in Nile-adjacent cities like Aswan or Luxor. In fact, felucas were photographed by writer Goran Schild's travels on the Nile in 1954-55 as part of his Mediterranean Sea travels, although he documented them as being called Ajasor. They are especially popular among tourists who can enjoy a quieter and calmer mood than motorboats have to offer, but they do seem to pop up all over the world. San Francisco, for instance, a large fleet of Latin-rigged felucas throng San Francisco's docks before and after the construction at the foot of Union Street of the state-owned Fisherman's Wharf in 1884. 
Light, small, maneuverable, these felucas were the mainstay of the fishing fleet of San Francisco Bay, featuring a mast and angled forward sharply, and a large triangular sail hanging down from a long two-piece yard. It's hard to see how these things could be much of use to anyone, but you can't argue with the popularity in the most widespread and unlikely of places. Number 12. The Coco Taxi the Coco Taxi is an auto rickshaw type taxi vehicle in Cuba, designed and invented by the Valencian polymath Jose Bergal Martiano. Once the design was approved, the plans were put in place to begin production, and by the end of the 1990s, use of the coconut taxi had begun in Havana. Mainly found in the cities of Havana, Varadero, and Trinidad, Coco Taxis are generally carrying two or three passengers in bucket style seats just behind the driver. The frame sits on three wheels, with a fiberglass body and a two-stroke engine. This Coco Taxi is so named because of its resemblance to half a coconut. And just as it's pretty easy to get a fractured skull if you're standing under a coconut tree when one decides to fall, Coco Taxis have developed a reputation for being pretty unsafe as well. In fact, the UK's government website states, quote, in view of serious accidents that have involved tourists, you should not use mopeds or three-wheeled Coco taxis for travel around Cuba, end quote. And it doesn't stop with the UK. Canada seems to feel much the same way, with their government website stating, quote, yellow three-wheeled Coco taxis are unsafe. You should avoid them, end quote. This may be because Coco taxis don't have any kind of governing body at all, and therefore no real health and safety policy. The Coco Taxis, you see, is not run by companies, but rather individual people just trying to make a living. So although the downside is that you may break, sprain, or graze something during a trip in one of these things, they do usually cost significantly less than regular taxis. So yeah, it's a bit of a gamble. Number 11. Tanga Tangas were popular before the advent of automobiles and are still in use in some parts of the Indian subcontinent. They are a popular mode of transportation, mainly due to the fact that they're fun to ride in and usually cheaper to hire than a taxi or a rickshaw. However, in many cities, tangas are not allowed to use highways because of their slow pace. In Pakistan, tangas are mainly found in the older parts of the cities and towns, becoming less popular for utilitarian travel and more popular for pleasure. Tangas have also become a traditional feature of weddings and other social functions in parts of the Indian subcontinent. A tanga is basically a light carriage or curricle drawn by one horse and often used for transportation. With a canopy over the carriage with a single pair of large wheels, a passenger can reach the seats from the rear while the driver sits in the front of the carriage. Some space is available for baggage below the carriage between the wheels, although the space is often used to carry hay for the horses. Tangas are also found in rural areas north of India like Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, and Punjab. Apart from the modern modes of transport, tangas still offer services at the entrance of bus stops and railway stations to transport luggage and passengers to their destination in small towns of North India. The culture of the tanga is disappearing due to the speed of modern transportation and the earnings people make. However, there are still some that continue to support them and keep the tradition alive. Tourists who come to India still take rides in the Tangas to experience their Indian charm. They're still among the most appreciated experiences of North India. Number 10. Barco de Totora Cabalitos de Totora are reed watercraft used by fishermen in Peru for the past 3,000 years, which has been archaeologically evidenced from pottery shards. Named for the way they're straddled when ridden, the name translates as little reed horses in English. This is not actually the original name, as horses weren't introduced to South America until after the Spanish conquest of the Inca Empire. The ancient Mochica name of the watercraft is Tup. They are made from the same reed, the Totora, used by the Uru people on Lake Titicaca, and have been considered part of the Peruvian national cultural heritage since 2016. On the beach of Pimentel, near to the town of Chicleo, however, fishermen have made minimal changes in the basic design of the reed boats over the centuries, with crafters now adding styrofoam to give symmetrical forms and to create a water-impermeable flotation compartment. Fishermen in the port town of Huachaco, famously, but in many other locations practically, still use these vessels today, riding the waves back into shore and suggesting some of the first forms of wave riding. There is even currently a minor debate in the surfing world as to whether or not this constitutes the first form of surfing. Number 9. Cyclos before the cyclo arrived in Vietnam, there was the rickshaw, a harsh and cruel means of transportation which even the French authorities found to be inhumane. 
So in the early 1930s, the French Public Works Ministry began trials on the three-wheeled replacements, showcasing their new designs in Paris with high publicity shows that featured Tour de France winners. Two years after those first prototypes, a man named Pierre Coupaud designed and built his own version to bring to French Indochina. Now, as it turned out, the authorities had been correct in their assessment. The cyclo was, in fact, revolutionary, but not in a subversive way. By the early 1940s, almost every rickshaw in Saigon had been replaced by this new vehicle. But sadly, as Vietnamese people embraced the motorbike, cyclo drivers found themselves hounded out of business in every major city. Motorbike drivers complained that cyclos clogged traffic because they were slow and wide. In response, authorities forced cyclos off the major streets, and by the mid-2000s, the cyclo had been pretty well banned in every major city. Nowadays, those tourists are only substantial customer base for cyclo drivers, and they're offered a more peaceful view of the surroundings, especially in places like Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi, where the traffic is insane. But the number of operators is still strictly regulated, and because of this, it's estimated that there are fewer than 300 cyclos left in downtown Ho Chi Minh City, and even fewer in other cities. In other words, the cyclo is a relic nowadays, an image of Vietnam that only exists for tourist money and photo ops. Number 8. The Ice Angel One cold day in 1991, 16-year-old Dan Bockler was out on Lake Superior when the ice gave out underneath him. The fire department quickly arrived at the scene to try to rescue him, but tragically realized the boy was too far out on the ice and drowned before he could be rescued. This tragic incident was a spurring moment for a new ice rescue program, and the Ice Angel was then born. It has been even nicknamed the Dan B in memory of poor Dan Bockler. In the 20 years since it was commissioned, the craft has performed dozens of rescues on Lake Superior's south shore. When a fisherman or someone gets stranded out on the ice or off the ice, there's nothing that can go out onto the water and back onto the ice, so the Ice Angel allows rescuers to do just that. It also means that a rescue operation that may have taken hours can be carried out a lot quicker, and that time is extremely valuable when the person they're rescuing might be experiencing hypothermia. On a normal rescue, there will be several people on board. The pilot who's driving, the navigator who sits in the front seat, and two people in the back called the swimmers who actually go out and do the rescue. Once the Ice Angel safely arrives on the scene with the unfortunate rescued person in their care, it's up to the firefighters and the EMTs to do the rest. Many similar sized departments in the United States probably don't have a craft like this, or if they do, they have something that's certainly not as large. So the Ice Angel has made a massive difference for the department and the people that they save. Long may it continue. Moving on to number seven, the Jeepney. Jeepneys are minibus-like public utility vehicles, serving as the most popular means of public transportation in the Philippines. They're known for their crowded seating and kitsch decorations, which have become a widespread symbol of Philippine culture and art, with an example being exhibited at the 1964 New York World's Fair as a national image for the Filipinos. In fact, an estimated 600,000 drivers nationwide depend on driving jeepneys for their livelihood. The jeepney is the cheapest way to commute in the Philippines, and because of its open rear door design, picking up and dropping off is easy for both passengers and drivers, and they can stop anywhere unlike buses. It's precisely because of this convenience, however, that jeepney drivers are making themselves pretty unpopular. Complaints include their habit of indiscriminately loading and unloading passengers in the middle of the street, blocking traffic, risking the safety of some passengers, and trip cutting, where drivers decide not to complete the route if it turns out not to be profitable for them, dropping confused tourists in the middle of nowhere. As such, some people are now requesting that this mode of transportation now be phased out, not least because they're also blamed as a major source of air pollution in cities due to their distorted subframes and poor emissions. In response to the cons of these jeepneys, however, a modernization program has been launched. Newly manufactured jeepneys such as e-jeepneys and modernized diesel jeepneys are required to have at least Euro 4 compliant engines or an electric engine and must contain safety features like speed limiters, accessible features like ramps and seat belts, closed circuit television cameras, Wi-Fi, USB ports, and GPS. Oh yeah, and a dashboard camera. Number 6. Chukudu First appearing in the 1970s in North Kivu, the Democratic Republic of Congo, during difficult economic times, chukudus have become a familiar sight around eastern parts of the country. This wooden vehicle, often used for transporting cargo, has an angular frame, two small wheels, handlebars, and a pad for the operator to place their knee while propelling the vehicle with their leg. While going downhill, the rider stands on the deck like a scooter, 
While riding on a flat surface, however, one knee is placed on the deck while the other foot is used to push against the ground, similar to a scooter. So why are these things so popular in the DRC? Well, they're very cheap and relatively simple to make, selling for around 150 US bucks with a cost of materials around 60. So you can turn a pretty good profit if you're a Chikudu maker. A small one can be built in about three hours using dimensional lumber and materials available in a hardware store. Although in Goma, where Chikudus form the backbone of the local transportation system, they're made of hard mumbo wood and eucalyptus wood with the scrap tires for wheel treads. These particular chikudus take about one to three days to build and last at least two to three years. They're usually around six and a half feet long with a load capacity of about 1,000 pounds. Now, some chikudus are equipped with a suspension to the front wheel, either in the form of a metal spring or a tensioned rubber band. And when you consider that the largest of them can carry pretty hefty weights, then they definitely need that. Number five, the camel bus. The fleet of the Havana Metro Bus, known as the Camel Bus for their two humps, were a familiar sight around Cuba until it became apparent they were in desperate need of modernization. These hulking 18-wheel beasts made of two Soviet-era buses welded together on a flatbed and pulled by a separate cab had long been Havana's public transport nightmare. Bumpy, hot, noisy, belching black smoke and jammed with up to 400 passengers at a time, at the start of the Camelo run, it would take over five minutes for passengers to swarm up the steps and through the narrow doors at the rear, with some of them even hanging out the windows. If you weren't fortunate enough to get one of the plastic seats, then you gotta stand until your destination, in very cramped and bumpy conditions. These camel buses had no shock absorbers. Every pothole would send a violent jolt through a passenger's feet. Route M6, running through the capital's southern outskirts, uptown of the University of Havana, was the city's last remaining camel bus route, but soon enough, municipal authorities were being told to pull it in. The camel bus was born in response to fuel shortages in the early 1990s, when the Soviet Union collapsed and Cuba lost its annual $6 billion in subsidies. The economy has since recovered, though, thanks to heavy borrowing from China and nearly 100,000 barrels of oil a day from Venezuela. As such, Cuba is now spending $2 billion to upgrade public transportation and has imported 3,000 modern buses just for the capital. These are apparently less sturdy than the camel buses, with crews repaving the streets to spare them wear and tear, and fares are also double that of the camel bus. On the other hand, they do offer far more seats and dramatically smoother rides, and riders can climb on or off a lot more easily, ensuring faster trips. That said, some locals do believe that when the new buses break down, the camel buses will return victorious. Number four, the Peel P50. The Peel P50 is a three-wheeled micro car originally made from 1962 to 65 by the Peel Engineering Company on the Isle of Man, and then from 2011 to present. It was listed in the 2010 Guinness World Records as the smallest production car ever made. The original model has no reverse gear, but a handle at the rear that allows the very lightweight car to be maneuvered physically when required. Yep, you can move it by hand, it's just that small. Designed as a city car, it was advertised in the 1960s as capable of seating one adult and a shopping bag, with only one door, one windscreen wiper, and one headlight. So, did people actually want to own one of these things? Well, no, not really. The company only produced about 50 P50s, of which 27 are still known to exist, although one of them sold for a record $176,000 at a Sotheby's auction in March of 2016. Weirdly, however, in 2010, Peel Engineering reinstated manufacturing of the P50 and Trident models from its premises in Sutton in Ashfield in England. Externally, this car is very similar to the original, with the same dimensions and curb weight, but the mechanical differences in the suspension, steering, and drivetrain, and a fully functioning reverse gear, hey hey, ensuring they're road legal under today's rules, which is pretty important, you know, for a car. Production included petrol models with a 49cc four-stroke engine, and an electric model with an electric motor and gelled electrolyte batteries. The top speed of both of these cars is about 28 miles an hour, so it's not the kind of thing you can take drifting around an empty car park to impress your teenage friends. Number three, Coracle. Designed for use in swiftly flowing streams, the Coracle has been in use in the British Isles for millennia, having been noted by Julius Caesar in his invasion of Britain in the mid-first century BC, and used in his military campaigns in Spain. A Coracle is a small, rounded, lightweight boat traditionally used in Wales, although the word Coracle is also used for similar boats found in India, Vietnam, Iraq, and Tibet. The structure is made of a framework of split and interwoven willow rods tied with willow bark. 
The outer layer was originally an animal skin such as horse or bullock hide with a thin layer of tar to waterproof it, today replaced by tailored calico, canvas, or fiberglass. The Asian version of the Coraco is made of interwoven bamboo and made waterproof by using resin and coconut oil. It's oval in shape and very similar to half a walnut shell. This coracle has a keelless flat bottom to evenly spread out the loads across the structure and to reduce the required depth of the water, often only to a few inches. This structure helps to make the boat more maneuverable and less likely to snag when using on narrow or shallow slow-running waterways. The Tafi coracle, for instance, is flat-bottomed and is designed to negotiate shallow rapids common on the river in the summer, while the Carmathan coracle is rounder and deeper because it's used in tidal waters on the Tiwi, where there are no rapids. Tifi coracles are made from locally harvested wood, willow for the laths or body of the boat, and hazel for the weave. These coracles use no nails, relying on the interweaving of the laths for structural coherence, whilst the Camarathon ones use copper nails and no interweaving. They are an effective fishing vessel because when powered by a skilled person, they hardly disturb the water or the fish and can be easily maneuvered with one arm while the other arm tends to the net. The coracle is propelled by means of a broad-bladed paddle, which traditionally varies in design between the different rivers, and it can be quite a hardy little vessel. In fact, in 1974, a Welsh coracle piloted by Bernard Thomas crossed the English Channel to France in 13 and a half hours. And you certainly can't say that for the boat your dad takes out fishing on the weekends. Number 2. Monte Toboggan These basket carts, known as Monte Toboggan, were invented in 1850, when the inhabitants of what was then the village of Monte wanted to travel quickly to Funchal below. Currently, they're one of the biggest tourist attractions of Madeira, with a two-kilometer route running through the streets of the city. Now, the vehicle reaches a speed of approximately 38 kilometers an hour when it arrives at the bottom station in about 10 minutes, being driven by men called carreros, who dress in white and wear straw hats. They now also use rubber-soled shoes that allow them to break the carts. Presently, and for a number of years now, the Monte Toboggan has been transporting thousands of tourists every year, seeking a ride full of emotions, adrenaline, and an unforgettable experience, with splendid views over the city and beyond. The ride starts off below the steps of the Monte Church, and it's the ideal complement to the ascent to Monte by cable car. Monte itself is a well-known beauty spot famous for its beautiful, lush gardens and splendid views over Funchal. The small village was formerly a health resort for Europe's high society, but has now become known as the Village of Carts, for obvious reasons. Number 1. Party Bike Well, here we are at number 1, so let's finish with a celebration, and with something you can celebrate on. A party bike is a multi-passenger human-powered vehicle, invented in 1997 by Hetz Vietzkaf BV from the Netherlands. Powered by the pedaling of the passengers themselves, while the steering and braking is controlled by a driver, some party bikes also double as rolling refreshment stands. Human-powered party bikes have grown into several families of vehicles for a variety of purposes, including tourist rentals and private touring, and are often used for staff parties and bachelor or bachelorette parties. They're often available at tourist attractions where they're rented out by the hour or day, and although used in conjunction with alcohol, as they frequently are, the bike is usually hired with a driver. A modern tourist party bike usually features open seating for eight or more riders in sociable configuration. Now, these vehicles are often designed to look like early 20th century trolley cars and have seating for the peddlers, a bench seat in the rear, rack and pinion steering, and a canopy top. A few manufacturers have even offered an electric assist motor to aid the riders on hilly terrain. Now, modern party bikes are typically between 15 to 20 feet long, about 7 feet wide and about 8 feet tall, and because they're driven on municipal streets, they have some headlights, taillights, and turn signals too. These pubs on wheels have become popular in the United States too, as well as the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, and France. As in many European municipalities, it's completely legal to consume alcohol while pedaling or riding this thing. Well, provided the driver isn't also imbibing, of course. Mind you, they aren't without their problems. In 2017, noise issues and traffic jams led to a ban on beer bikes in the center of Amsterdam, and in 2013 in downtown Minneapolis, a full party bike operated by a large beer bike company tipped right onto its side, with two of the riders being taken to the hospital by ambulance. In other words, they're good fun, but not always. I will see you guys next time. Thank you to our channel members.